ano mai hari mai a tena koto tena koto tena koto kato a ko ena toko ingoa ke wai papa tamata rau a hau e mahiana. So a very warm welcome to everyone today. Um, my name is Anna Sancho. I work at the University of Auckland, um, but I'm also part of the Genomics Aotearoa Fano. Um, is co lead with Shannon Clark, uh, Thomas Buckley, and David Shagney in the High Quality Genomes in Population Genomics Project. Um, for those of you that are not aware, um, Genomics Aotearoa is a collaborative research platform for genomics and bioinformatics. Um, and with a number of projects that within that framework that span health, uh, primary production and ecological genomics uh, with Vision Mataranga and our commitments under Tiriti at the core of our activities. Um, so it's my great privilege to welcome Dr. Tom Usting uh, to, as our speaker for today. Um, Tom's a research fellow with the Genomics Aotearoa High Quality Genomes and Population Genomics Project um, and is based at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, so I believe he's been in that role as a research fellow for around a year, also following his PhD uh, based at Victoria. Um, and he worked there with Pete Ritchie, uh, Marin Wellenruta, and Nick Rollins for his PhD, uh, Connecting the Past, Present and Future, um, a Population Genomics Study of Australasian Snapper. And I think we're lucky enough to hear some of that research today. Um, but as a bit more background, um, Tom completed his master's research at the University of Groningen, uh, focusing on population gene genetic structure of North Atlantic blue whale. And so he brings this wonderful expertise in population genetics, uh, bioinformatics, as well as marine biology uh, into our genomics Aotearoa projects. So uh, today his talks on the application of genomics and fisheries science, a population study of Australasian snapper in New Zealand, uh, as I said, predominantly based upon that fabulous work that he did uh, as part of his PhD, but linking really nicely into his current research fellow position, uh, thinking about the impact of structural variants on adaptation in snapper. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. I see everyone's joined with cameras off and, um, and they're might themselves muted. Um, if you can keep yourselves that way for the talk, that will be fabulous. Uh, but if you do have any questions as we travel, please just pop them in the chat and we'll come back at, at the end. It's always good to pop them in the chat so you remember to ask them at the end. Um, and I'll, I'll ask if anyone wants to uh, give, give a question at the end or else I can read a question from the chat as well. Um, so I'll shush now and, and just hand over to Tom. So thank you very much, Tom, for, for joining us. Uh, great, Anna, thank you. Yeah, so welcome everybody. Uh, let me just boot up my PowerPoint here. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for Genomics Atira for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about my research here. Um, uh, thank you also very much, Anna, for the nice, uh, for the nice introduction. Like she said, I, uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands uh, and moved here to New Zealand a little bit over four years ago to do my PhD here, uh, together with Pete Martin and Nick uh, on the population genomic uh, study of, of SNAPA. Um, so this is also this will also be the primarily what I'll be uh, uh, presenting today, as I were, and I wanted to focus on the application of, of my research and how we can potentially use it in uh, in fishery science. So. Um, I wanted to start by uh, showing one of these initial graphs that I had in my introduction to a uh, chapter with, for SNAP. And one of the, the key questions that I had throughout my, uh, my thesis was how can we utilize the genome-wide genetic variation to study the population and, and, and evolutionary di dynamics of SNAPA? So these different questions were then, this question was then uh, subdivided into a number of different sub-questions. Uh, what is the, the the distribution of genetic variation? Is it possibly to identify demographically independent populations? Um, what is the evolutionary history of SNAPA and uh, what genes uh, and associated traits can we uh, identify that could put, uh, potentially be under selection due to either climate change or fishing or any other um, um, uh, environmental challenge? Uh, so the data that I'll be presenting today will uh, come out of my uh, my data chapters two and four, and like I said, really focus on the application of um, of uh, of population genomic analysis in fisheries research. Uh, before moving on, um, I uh, want to acknowledge and thank the work of Mark Finwick for facilitating our discussions about research directions and data towards Tonga species. Uh, so why is genomics so essential for fisheries research? Um, one of the main uh, uh, things that characterizes fish is that they have very high dispersal potential and very large population sizes, 
which uh, generally leads to very low levels, low levels of, of genetic differentiation, which often implies that there's a lack of power uh, to detect population structure using conventional genetic markers. So this is where genomics uh, is, is, is extremely useful, as we can actually utilize the entire genome and actually look for, for, for uh, genetic regions that actually suit, um, that actually suit our needs within fisheries management. So apart from why genomics is essential uh, for fisheries research, another thing is why are fish actually great for genomic research as well, because it's a really good matchup. Um, first of all, fish have relatively small genomes. So you see here this graph from a paper in 2020. It's based on 244 uh, different fish species. And you can see that the main genome size is roughly around uh, 870 megabases, with the, with the majority being um, a little bit under uh, 1.5 megabases. So it, it's it, this uh, fish are very economical species actually do hold genome sequencing because, uh, because the genomes are, are relatively small. Another good thing about uh, a lot of vertebrate data, they are mainly diploid. Um, so the, the, they're fairly easy to work with from a, uh, from a, a, a genotyping uh, perspective, unless you move into stuff uh, such as salmon. Which is a, a whole nother whole nother issue that I haven't uh, dared to dabble in myself. And uh, because the populations are so large, uh, natural selection can act very efficiently. Um, this is because um, uh, random random genetic drift is, um, um, is is fairly small. So even traits with very low uh, selection coefficients can actually move through a population very very efficiently. Which makes it uh, makes the organism uh, really interesting to use and study um, uh, evolutionary dynamics. Um, so, what are we actually waiting for? Because genomics is in, uh, is incredibly interesting to to apply to fisheries genomics, and we can use it potentially for stock identification, uh, genetic monitoring, so uh, stock abundance, or even uh, look at uh, uh, monitoring the genetic diversity. We can also look at stock connectivity, so how much exchange is there between different areas, and Ethan uh, uh, can potentially use it for genetic tagging instead of uh, more um, more uh, classic approaches such as um, um, uh, cut, uh, catch and recapture. Um, and also look in, uh, into uh, ad, uh, into adaptive changes, so to, to test for fishing induced evolution or or, the, or any other traits or, in, or environmental factors that might be. Uh, influencing these, these fish species. So um, after we uh, applied genomics and actually able to identify these, uh, the, these relevant market sets uh, that actually are able to help us answer these questions, we can then use them to, to scale them down to smaller market panels and actually start applying them potentially and hopefully, hopefully start applying these into a more um, uh, uh, in industrial scale. So the work that I've uh, uh, done over the last four years uh, uh, pri primarily focused on uh, Australian snapper. Uh, a little, little bit of background. Um, snapper is one of the largest fisheries in New Zealand with uh, uh, an annual catch of uh, 6,400 tons uh, on, a, uh, on an annual basis. So to put that in contrast, uh, one of the, uh, the next ones is um, Tarakihi with roughly 5,000. Um, and these, uh, this commercial fishing is, has been subdivided over six different management areas, four of which are actually actively being fished. So we've got uh, the, the largest two, as you'll see on the, on the figure here, snapper one and eight. And then we also got snapper two and seven, which are being commercially fished. And then the other two, snapper three, where uh, snapper doesn't occur a lot, although it is moving into those areas because oceans are warming up. And then we've got snapper 10 at the top. Uh, which is a fisheries exclusion zone because it's the Kermitix. Uh, within these fish regions, we actually currently recognize or thought to be eight different stocks, which has been based on growth rate. So in, in Snapper 1, we've got uh, three high, high hypothesized stocks, which are Northland, Haruki Gulf, and Bay of Plenty. Uh, they're thought to be two different stocks in Snapper 2 uh, on either side of the, uh, of the Mahia Peninsula. Uh, two in Snapper Seven, one thought to be present in Marlborough Sound, one in Tasman Bay, and there's one uh, this thought to be one stock uh, on the west coast in Snapper Eight. And uh, next to that is uh, it is commercially being fished. It's being commercially fished very intensively, and actually up to a point that um, uh, the the Snapper stocks almost reached uh, the hard limit of ten percent, which actually indicates uh, that the fisheries has collapsed and. Um, 
uh, and as the rule is that when a fisheries actually breaches that hard that hard limit, the entire fisheries is being shut down. So it's actually a species that actually needs quite active management. Uh, so the research aims that I'll present throughout this talk is um, is actually to to, uh, to assess the the distribution of, of genetic variation, identify genetic markers relevant uh, for, for monitoring SNAPPER without the question mark, um, test for uh, genomic regions on selection, uh, identify functionally interesting regions and genes. So to give a, a quick layout of the sampling scheme that I've used for my thesis that um, uh, in order to collect all the samples, we work together with, uh, with MPI and NIWA and, uh, and a range of other people. We've actually visited uh, multiple fishing competitions in Hawke's Bay and Gisborne as well in order to collect, uh, uh, to collect fin clips. Uh, in total, we collected uh, a little bit over a thousand tissues and uh, ended up uh, sequencing 350 uh, individuals amongst 10 different uh, sampling sites, which you can see here. Um, so first, if we look at the genetic diversity present within SNAPPER, we can actually see that the, uh, the genetic diversity is actually relatively high, uh, especially despite the intense fishing pressure. Uh, this is actually something that we're finding in a range of different fish species, also such as Atlantic cod, that even though they've been fished pretty extensively, we actually do find that they're able to maintain relatively healthy levels of, of, of genetic diversity. Um, Early in the talk of Emily, uh, who uh, showed some data on Hokie, I think her levels of genetic variation were fairly similar, uh, similar to the ones that I'm showing here. So I'm actually showing two different metrics. So we've, I'm showing heterozygosity using my uh, my quality control data set. So actually, after removing all low quality SNPs, and the heterozygosity of my, of my neutral data set. Um, and one interesting thing to note, actually, there's actually no no regional, no evidence for a local loss of uh, genetic diversity, which uh, is in contrast to a paper uh, published in 2002 by Hauser, who showed that there was loss of genetic variation in the Tasman Bay area. Uh, uh, the, the data used for that study was actually based on microsatellites, which actually have a really high um, allele count and which might be distorting a little bit the data. But it's interesting to see that depending on the different marker sets that we use, we actually do get different measurements of, uh, of, of, uh, of genetic variation. And I personally think there's quite an interesting discussion to be ahead here, like what kind of marker sets should we actually use to, to monitor these species? Should we use neutral genetic variation? So we actually see the movement of, uh, of alleles throughout the population and see if they decrease overall, or is there a different way that we can actually characterize the, uh, the genetic variation present within a population is actually relevant in order for, uh, for managing these species. So what is the distribution of, gene of neutral genetic variation? This is often the starting point for a lot of population genetic studies because there uh, uh, are less assumptions or there's actually more assumptions being made about how they move about in a population. So if we look at this DAPC plot here, uh, what you can see here is that uh, the 10 different sampling sites are actually distributed uh, uh, between two different uh, clusters, with Gisborne being sort of like an intermediate location where mixing appears to be going on. And we can also see that the West Coast in Hawke's Bay in the right, uh, on the right side of the graph is also actually being uh, genetically slightly more similar to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the groups on the left side. So we can visualize this, this world in a different way. Oh yeah, I'd just like to highlight that for in order to uh, generate this data set, we use roughly 170,000 neutral SNPs. Um, so to visualize this in a slightly different way is we have pairwise FSTs values here, where we can see uh, where we can again see that we've got these two different clusters with Gisman being this intermediate uh, group where mixing uh, tends to occur. And we can also see that uh, both Hawke's Bay and the West Coast appear to be uh, less differentiated from, uh, from the other cluster. Uh, com, uh, compared to the other ones. And if we visualize this here on the map, uh, what uh, I think is actually going on is that we've got this northern cluster here and the southern cluster, and there's individuals moving from the northern cluster into the southern cluster. And that's why we actually see that the west, both the West Coast and the Hawke's Bay area actually appear to be genetically more similar because they are, are, are on the edges of these, uh, of these two clusters where uh, genetic variation is actually slowly moving into, into the other clusters. So we see mixing occurring around here at the Cape Renga and uh, the Mahia Peninsula. But also what we see is that there's quite a lot of gene flow around New Zealand and um, 
So there's a lot of gene flow between different sampling locations and also between recognized stocks. So um, uh, it's, it's interesting to see that, um, uh, that, that this is occurring around New Zealand. So is this relevant for fisheries management? Is this, uh, it is definitely relevant in a way that we actually know how genetic variation is moving around New Zealand, but it doesn't give us the fine scale resolution that we might want to use in order to actually apply this to fisheries management. So one of the ways that we're moving, that we've moved forward for this throughout my PhD is that we really actually decided to use a lot to utilize the genome and look for outliers. So the, the thought is that uh, different groups of individuals will be more uh, more adapted to their to their local environment and actually show uh, uh, potentially signs of adaptation to the to their specific areas. So what we've done is we used a package uh, outflank to uh, to look for outliers and plot these uh, across the genome, which you can see here on the on the bottom right. And then we uh, identified the, the the highest outliers and used these as um, uh, to, to look at a potential population structure. So if we do that again, uh, and, we, and we plot this out in the PCA, which you see here, you, uh, you'll notice that we have roughly the same distribution of individuals, but we're only needing to use 134 SNPs rather than 170,000, which I showed using the, uh, the, uh, the neutral variation. So or we already see a very large reduction of um, of, of SNPs that we need to actually to, in, in order to get a specific type of, uh, of resolution. And we can actually see here that already one of the populations, Kapiti Coast, um, which is, uh, hasn't been flagged as a, as, an, as a separate group, actually jumps out here. And we can already see that we're getting this more fine scale population structure that, uh, that we might be after. Uh, to sort of see if we can differentiate these different populations, again, we, we split up the data sets into a, a northern and a southern group and we again try to identify loci so if you look here at the southern cluster if we remove the northern uh, the northern population we actually identified 72 SNPs that are actually uh, able to start to segregate these other five populations so again we see we can see again that um, uh, the Capiti coast is starting to, uh, to to separate from the other ones but we also see that the Hawke's Bay which is already uh, shown to be quite different from the other ones, is starting to separate, and also the uh, the Karamea bite, which I'll come back to in a little bit. And then again, if we try to separate the other two populations, we can actually see that if we just do an outlier analysis on those two populations, we identify 120 SNPs, actually very clearly able to uh, to separate these populations. And then again, if we just do this for the northern cluster. We can see that if we, uh, when we identify 104 uh, outlier SNPs, we can separate Gisborne, which was already identified as a, uh, uh, as a slight of a, an intermediate group, but we can also see that Eastscape is starting to, to separate from the other three populations. Uh, unfortunately, when we try to, to, to separate the other three uh, uh, areas where, uh, where different stocks are, are thought to be located, we actually couldn't identify any SNPs. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there are Different stocks, uh, uh, different stocks present. It could merely mean that actually it is one stock, or the stocks are mixing too much that we might uh, need to utilize to uh, a mixed stock analysis, or that we still can't get the uh, the needed uh, resolution in order to separate these uh, these these stocks. So if we visualize this here on this map, you can see that all the all the sampling sites circled in green here, we're actually starting to see some form of uh, of, of separation that we can identify. And then we've got the three populations here in Snapper 1, Northland, Haruki Gulf, and Bay of Plenty that we actually still can't be able to separate. But it is great to see that we're actually using these outlier loci that we can actually uh, identify these, um, the, the, these different areas and actually use this potentially in the future. Um, are these populations demographically independent? Um, no, we don't really know that. All we know is that there are a specific loci that appear to resist movement between these areas, which could be showing that uh, the, the individuals located in these sites are actually uh, locally adapted. It could still mean that there's enough um, uh, movement uh, between these areas that they are actually uh, demographically linked. But I think it's also, um, important that, uh, that we need a more nuanced stock model. So something that takes into consideration the conservation of adaptive potential. So even if two different populations are uh, considered to be demographically linked, if different areas uh, actually harbor um, a specific uh, adaptive variants, it is, it is required that we need to take this into account in order to maintain the uh, viability of these, of these different populations. 
Uh, finally, I would quickly here like to note on the separation of the Kermia bite. Um, so as far as we know, there are no spawning grounds uh, along the, uh, the west coast of the South Island. So the, the easiest assumption to make here is that these individuals are coming from, from Tasman Bay and then further moving down. So the question is why, are, why can we actually find these outlier SNPs here in this population? Is, this, um, is it because we, we're missing a specific spawning ground or is it because these individuals are actually moving down and there's selection occurring? And uh, could uh, Keramia be representing a, an, an, an adaptive front that is causing Snapper to move further down, uh, uh, further down the coast? Something that is expected to happen uh, with um, with changes in, in climate and oceans warming up. So that sort of gives me a nice little segue to uh, the second part of my presentation. Like, is there evidence for selection uh, occurring in Snapper populations? So snapper are subjected to a range of environmental pressures and to, uh, 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 one of the important ones, of course, being climate change. Uh, what you see here is a graph of one of our master students, Amber Brooks, that she uh, finished in 2019, where she used different climate models to, uh, to model the, uh, the changes in distribution of species around New Zealand. So what you see here on the left-hand side is the, the current projection uh, of snapper around New Zealand. And on the right side, you can actually see that and on the specific uh, projections of, of climate change, you can see that SNAP is actually further uh, moving further down uh, along the west coast. So it is expected to, uh, that the SNAP are moving the, further down the coast. And in fact, we're actually already seeing the SNAP are being uh, seen a little bit more often in the Dunedin Harbour or actually uh, just moving down the west coast of the South Island. So what is happening with these populations? Are these populations simply moving further down the coast because waters are warming up? Or is there actually some form of selection going on that actually makes them move, uh, move down the coast? Uh, another one of the uh, potential uh, environmental factors that might be influencing selection in snapper is fishing pressure. Um, as I showed this graph here before, you can see that snapper have been fished quite extensively. Uh, actually close up to the point where we almost had to uh, shut down the fisheries and because the, uh, the snapper fisheries almost collapsed. They are luckily uh, recovering, which is a good sign, but it still means there's a, that there's a, far, a large uh, environmental pressure that might be uh, causing selection to occur within snapper. And uh, selection due to fishing is actually quite a big, big topic over the last couple of years. You can see here a a figure from a research paper published in 2015 that actually showed uh, changes in maturation and changes in growth in uh, um, um, a number of different species. And one of the question is whether these changes in maturation and growth are related to, uh, to genetic changes or is this part of the phenotypic plasticity of these species? Um, and based on archaeological data, we can actually see that snapper used to be much larger. So we can actually see that the average size of snapper have decreased over the last 600 years. So there is reason to believe that, um, that the snapper uh, have, have become smaller. The question is, uh, are we just not letting them grow bigger because we, can, we fish them out of, the, out of the ocean too soon before, to be, before they get to a larger size? Or is this because of phenotypic plasticity? Or is there more going on? Is there actually uh, 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 genetic changes occurring? So in order to test for evidence of selection, um, I did uh, a number of selection scans. Um, the first scan that I did was actually north versus south. So it was quite interesting to see whether I could find signs of selection occurring between these two different areas. And then as a second scan, I actually focused here on Karamia Bight, uh, where uh, it was actually interesting to see if we could find signs of selection um, uh, occurring between the Tasman Bay, which is currently thought to be the spawning ground for these uh, individuals along the along the Karamia Bight, and see if there's actually any any signs, or if we can identify specific genes that might be showing signs of selection. Um, so I used a range of comparative uh, selection statistics, such as FST, DXY, and uh, the difference in between uh, Tajima's D, uh, in order to sort of to contrast these two populations. But I also use a number of uh, population specific selection statistics to actually see that if there are no differences between these two populations, might selection still be occurring, be occurring in both? Because in that case, uh, something as FST will not be picking it up. Or uh, if selection is occurring uh, uh, fairly recently, we, we might not be able to pick it up because allele, uh, um, allele frequencies will not have changed enough in order to pick them up. 
So the important one here to notice is the G12 statistic, which is uh, similar to the integrated haplotype score, and it's a measure of homozygosity within a specific region of the genome. But this uh, statistic is uh, um, specific to, for using um, non-phase data, so which is quite ideal for my for my specific data set. And then again, I also used uh, not the difference between TGMSD, but TGMSD itself in order to look for changes in the population specifically. So uh, I know this is a bit graph, but this is uh, sort of the output that I got from my selection tests. So what you see here is a big Manhattan plot with the 24 uh, chromosomes uh, down, the, uh, down the bottom uh, and uh, the different selection statistics down the top. So the points in green are actually the statistics that are doing a, com a comparative analysis between the northern and the southern cluster. And then the orange and the purple ones actually show um, a di a diversity values specific to one of the two populations. And the way that we have uh, identified uh, regions of interest was by using a 1% uh, uh, outlier uh, boundary. And then I actually manually went through all these regions in order to see if there, if there were specific areas that were of interest that fitted with the hypothesis of either uh, being affected by climate change or, uh, uh, or potentially fishing. So I wanted to focus on four different regions here within the genome. Um, two of which are showing a uh, fairly strong uh, divergence between the northern and the southern cluster, and two regions that you'll see here down the bottom which actually show quite large increases of homozygosity within both of these regions that might be uh, hinting towards a selective sweep. So if we first look at the, uh, the two points here that show a high uh, level of, ge of genetic differentiation between the northern and the southern cluster, we can see that we have these two areas. And uh, what you'll see here at the top are, are genes located within this specific region. So if you have the one here on the left, we actually, uh, I went through uh, quite an extensive number of different genes and tried to do a, a gene ontology uh, analysis, which got a little bit too extensive for my PhD, but I did look into all the functions of these different genes. And what we, uh, one of the genes that I identified within this region was this MAST2 gene, which uh, appears to be linked to the expression of the epidermal growth factor. And then if we look here in the other region, we have this, uh, this HK2 gene, uh, which in humans has been linked to, uh, uh, to glycolysis and, so, and associated to cell growth. And one, uh, one other interesting thing to note here about this second graph is actually that in a southern cluster, you can see that it, uh, the TGMSD is positive. Uh, and usually that uh, most often it indicates either a population contraction or balancing selection. And if we would have expected a, a contraction of the population, we would expect uh, more parts of the genome to be elevated to be positive. But uh, there's, a, there's a chance here that this might be hinting towards balancing selection. Um, and this is something that does fit with the southern population that I've used because the actually, there's actually a large uh, differences between uh, temperature on a, uh, uh, within this cluster. So it could mean that actually multiple alleles for this gene are being maintained within the population. Um, yeah, so then uh, if we zoom in on these other two regions that actually show quite high levels of um, uh, runs of homozygosity within this region, we've got, these two, we've got these two regions. So you can see that both the northern and the southern cluster are actually showing um, uh, increases of, of homozygosity in these regions. Uh, and then again, if we uh, zoom in here on some of these genes that we can find, and we actually, within both of these regions, we find two genes that appear to be involved in, 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 blood, uh, in blood vessel uh, development. And after a little bit of digging online, I was able to find a, a study that appears to link the, uh, the development of, of, uh, of uh, blood vessels with uh, maturation in, uh, in zebrafish. So while this is quite contentious and um, we haven't shown anything uh, to, to be causally connected, it is interesting to see that we find these regions that appear to be on the selection either now or fairly recently that have some form of a link with maturation, which fits with the idea of, uh, um, uh, of potential changes happening through, uh, uh, through fishing pressure. And then we also have this last gene that, that's located within here uh, there's a mut k gene, which is actually involved with uh, in, a, in a signaling pathway, and which is involved with uh, immune response and and a cell proliferation. But it's quite far downstream, so there could be heaps of different um, 
molecular functions that actually could be influenced by this gene. So then if we look into uh, the other selection scanner that I performed specifically between the Tasman Bay and the Karamea Bight uh, um, uh, sampling areas, uh, we can actually see here that uh, the, the differences in between annual temperature between these two different regions is actually quite large. So this is actually one of the reasons why we were interested to actually see if these area, these individuals in the Karamea Bight might be getting better adapted to actually living in colder waters. So again, we have this um, uh, this uh, Manhattan plot with the same with the same statistics, and after going through these different regions that were flagged as being potentially under selection, I went through all these regions and identified two specific regions that were of specific interest. You also see like the quite large peak again on uh, linkage group seven, but that was the same one as I presented um, uh, that was sh uh, showing selection in. Um, uh, in the north and south comparison as well. So if we look here into uh, these specific regions, you can see that the increase in Homo zagosti is actually specific to the Karamea bite population and not in a Tasman Bay population, showing that selection might only be occurring within this, uh, the, this, this Karamea bite region. And if we look at the genes again that are located within, uh, within these regions, uh, for instance, we have this KSR2 uh, gene here, which is uh, shown to uh, uh, regulate energy balance by feeding behavior and adaptive uh, thermogenesis. And in this other one, we have this, uh, this other gene, which has also been shown to be uh, related to cold stress tolerance. So it's again, interesting to see that we, if we look around, and we are able to, to identify these regions that do show signs of selection and uh, arguably uh, have a, some, sort, some form of an arbitrary selection in here uh, for me actually specifically mentioning these regions, but it is, it is cool to see that we actually can find, uh, can find these regions and uh, do be able to show some form of association with the previous hypothesis. So is this evidence for selection that's going on within these regions? No, it's, it's not evidence for selection, but I think it is a great starting point for us to actually look into these regions and actually uh, uh, start to find out what might be going within SNAPR. So we actually do have these, these genes that, uh, uh, that show uh, local selection. So there's either that's happening in the northern and the southern cluster, which appear to be related to growth, or we have these genes that show nationwide selection, uh, which might be linked to, uh, to maturation. And even within the, uh, the Karamea bite population, we might see these, uh, the, these specific genes that could be related to cold stress. But even if it's selection, what is causing this selection? Is it either climate change, is it fishing pressure, or is it any other in, in environmental pressure that we simply have not taken into consideration? That's very much a question that is still open. And it's something that I'm looking forward to addressing in the future. Uh, so how to move forward from having this type of information? Uh, one of the things that we're currently doing throughout uh, uh, within my postdoc is we're starting to apply seascape genomics in order to sort of to correlate these differences in genetic variation uh, with, uh, with, with environmental factors. So what you see here again uh, is a PCA where we again have this north-south divide between these two populations. And uh, within this uh, um, uh, RDA, this redundancy analysis, we, we actually found a significant interaction between the distribution of variation and an environment and environmental factors along the first axes. Um, just to highlight, this is purely done on only linkage group uh, group ten. So, uh, if you look at so in the middle of this graph, you can see like the uh, the grey dots centered in the middle, which actually represent all the SNPs that have been used in order to um, uh, to create this RDA. And we can zoom into these uh, into these points and actually look at the at the SNPs that are causing this significant correlation between genetic differentiation and environmental pressures, and actually what uh, what type of in uh, what type of environmental uh, parameter is actually causing causing this? So what you can see here that is that most of the dots that you see colored up here that show a, a significant interaction are actually related to the mean temperature uh, of um, of the ocean. And the cool thing is because we know which SNPs they are, we can actually look up where they are located within the genome. And if we do that for linkage group ten we actually find that the majority of these SNPs are actually located within the specific region that was previously already identified as being potentially under selection. So this is sort of how we're working through these, these, these types of data sets that we're identifying these regions and then in a separate way, 
trying to uh, uh, try to identify if we can correlate this uh, this with any environmental pressure. So uh, personally, I think this is quite a quite a, a cool result that we're seeing uh, that we're actually trying being able to merge the results of these two uh, of these two two data sets and see that they actually um, correspond. So to uh, to wrap up this uh, presentation, uh, I wanted to come back to some of the, the the goals that I had. So the application of uh, population genomic analysis and fisheries research. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the questions was was to assess the distribution of genetic variation, and we can actually see that there were high levels of genetic diversity despite being high fishing pressure, which is good to see for uh, such uh, in intensively fished populations. We can also see the high levels of genetic uh, connectivity at present between stocks, and that, and that adaptive variation highlights the need for changes in how we maintain these healthy and viable stocks. Uh, again, we can also use these uh, adaptive uh, genetic variation to uh, uh, to provide more fine scale population structure that could provide useful for future population management. And it is quite uh, cool to see that we can actually uh, start looking into these uh, patterns of selection and use these selection scans to identify these regions of interest uh, and providing tentative evidence for the effects of potentially climate change or, uh, or, uh, or fishing on, on snapper evolution. So uh, throughout my PhD, I had a tremendous amount of help from uh, a lot of people. First of all, my, super, my supervisors, uh, Peter, Maran, Nick, and Bastian, the entire uh, Richie Lab group, uh, which officially, especially Ivan, who started out at the same time as me and uh, almost finished at the same time as me. So he was really a great person to have in order to uh, go, go through this experience. Uh, we've done a whole lot of ancient DNA work, which I haven't even actually gotten around to, which was actually in the other data chapter that which I didn't have time to present. Uh, the sampling for MPI and NEWA, uh, one of our master students, Leah, uh, uh, fishing clubs, uh, all the people at SBS here, and also the people that run our high performance cluster, because I think most people here will recognize the value of somebody that can actually help you out with getting programs installed. And some packages don't work, you need to update it and all that sort of stuff. So Andre and Wes were very instrumental for ABLE in, in order to, for me to, to do my PhD. Um, and also very much thanks to the Marsden Foundation for, for funding the PhD and all the other institutions that were related to my research. Thank you very much. <laughs>